look at the news, you look at your families, you look at your spirit and your own life, you'll realize that there ain't a whole lot of peace going on anymore. I mean, the reality is, you know what, when it comes to peace between black and white and Hispanics and even, you know, Hawaiians or Indians, whoever it might be, there's not a lot of peace in those relationships together. There's not a lot of peace when it comes to marriages that suffer and fall apart. This person doesn't like this person, and, and they're in the same house, but there's no peace in that home. And peace between you and your children, and all of a sudden, you know what, you're, you're trying to live at peace with them, but they're always at odds, and, and you just can't seem to bridge the gap between you and their lives. There's always dysfunction and distraction and hindrances to, to peace. And you look around the world, and we think about terrorism and violence and all the stuff that's going around, and we wonder to ourselves, where is this peace that that was said by the angels to Jesus. I, I bring to you good news of great joy that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And they say, peace on earth and goodwill to men. Well, where is this peace on earth in our homes, in our churches, in our own lives? Why don't we experience peace? And Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We're in the heart of Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We look forward to you joining us in person sometime soon as we worship the Lord together.
That was good, Brother Wayne. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I'm just glad to be here this morning for the specific reason of the fact that a good buddy of mine, and I'm trying to find where he's sitting at this morning. Uh, did Owen leave to go back to work and all, or is he, he around? Well, good. I'll talk about him since he's, he's not in here this morning. Uh, all, all of a sudden, I, I go last night, and we're watching the LSU game. I mean, you know, what better way to spend a Saturday night than watching the LSU game? And all of a sudden, it was about, you know, third quarter or so, and he decides, well, you know what, let's walk down to the river through the woods, and, you know, it hadn't been bush hogged in a while, and, you know, and so all these... Uh, you know, all I've got is like sliders or, you know, flip-floppy kind of things. And so he's like, let's go down there with some machetes and, and some, like, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get some flashlights. Let's go down to the river. Now, friends, I don't know if you've ever noticed this about your preacher and stuff, but I'm not exactly, you know, swamp material. And so, so he's getting me down in the boonies. I mean, this is how all the scary movies end up, and it's always the guys that are like my color that end up, you know, stuck out there in the woods somewhere. You know, y'all y'all just running from me and stuff. So, you know, I realize that, so I'm just glad, I'm just really glad to be here this morning. He didn't leave me, I didn't die, the big old spiders run my way, and I'm like having my machete the whole time. You know, y'all ain't getting, y'all ain't killing, y'all ain't killing me. But, but I came across, and sometimes on Facebook, Facebook. Uh, I've got some church friends who like to send me stuff on Facebook. So let me let me show you some of the things that they sent me. For example, uh, he, these are memes. All right, these are little pictures. Some of y'all may have seen this. For example, this one says that one kid at church that won't stop staring at you. Uh, some of y'all have already noticed that. That little kid's head just turned around looking at you the whole time. Here's another one they sent me. Uh, when they do an altar call, you try to act like you don't need God. Uh, you know, I, I realize this over and over again. There's a lot of times that some of y'all are like, you know what, I need to make decisions for the Lord. I probably should go and pray, uh, but I'm just holding on. Here's another one you cell phone users can understand this one. What your cell phone sounds like in church when it goes off. Uh, here's another one. Uh, Christians be like, Lord, let this food be a nourishment to our bodies. Uh, that's how it was in our Sunday school class this morning. Or how about this one, when the pastor says every head bowed and all eyes closed. Uh, I've had to tell our praise team and stuff, I'm like, look, you know, you're on video right now, you're on camera, so every time y'all are moving around, y'all stand at each other, I don't know about you, you know, you're supposed to keep your eyes closed during prayer, and they're all talking and stuff, you know, they get them all on camera. Here's another one, is that, that church hug. Uh, you know, don't, don't get too close to stuff. Some of y'all teenagers like to get a little bit closer than maybe you should. Uh, but here's another one. Uh, that after church nap time. This is kind of, you know, we're on the clouds. Here's another one. The face you make when the lady behind you in church takes forever to open up her peppermint. <laughs> you, you probably say that. Here's another one. The preacher calls out exactly what you're going through. Another one says, when people let their kids run around the sanctuary like they've done lost their mind. Get that look. Or, or some of y'all ladies can understand this one. Church girls be like, these are from walking in and walking out only. All right, look at the few next to you. You may see somebody kick off their shoes already. A bunch of flip-flop wearing folks. Hey, this one's from just sort of Brother Waylon himself. Every worship leader under 30. We've been trying to get him to do his hair like that, but he hadn't, uh, he hadn't quite given into that. Here's another one with that awkward moment at church when you go for a handshake and they want to go for a hug. <laughs> it's like, what, what do I do with that? And then here's the last one. Uh, when you have to say hello to your ex at church. <laughs> <laughs> All right, change that one. All right. Look, then, now look, uh, I wanted to give y'all something to laugh about, something to kind of, you know, to kind of spark the interest a little bit, because the reality is uh, you won't be doing a whole lot of laughing for a long time. All right, so I wanted you to kind of feel good about yourself, because I'm going to try to lay it on you, like, like just beat you up this morning in a good godly way. Uh, they already had it on a Wednesday night, just trying to step on as many toes as I could, and so I want to do that again this morning, just to honor the Lord and to make Him happy this morning. We want to do that. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3, is where we're going to this morning. But we've been looking at what it means to have and live the blessed life. I guarantee you, if there's anything that you want, you want God's blessing in your life. You want God to show His favor and His grace over your life. I guarantee you, that's what, that's what you really, on, on the most deepest level of who you are, uh, besides all the stuff the world has to offer, you want God's blessing. Amen? Anybody want this God's blessing? And so, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3, when you find that honor the Lord and the honor of His word, would you stand with me as we just read what is known as the Beatitudes, the keys to a blessed life. The Bible says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then where we are this morning, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Father, this morning, I pray that you just speak to us. Father, this is something that we need to know and do and live as we leave here this morning. You've already spoken to our hearts these last couple of weeks about being poor in spirit and mourning. 
But this morning, Father, would you use all that you've given on the inside of us to change the outside of us as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the word blessed in the Bible. If we were to define that, it's talking about the fact that, you know what, you could define that as happy. And so happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are the peacemakers. Happy are those who mourn. You say, well, I don't understand that. But it says happy or fortunate, favored, to be deeply satisfied is what that word blessed means in the Bible. And so when we read this passage of Scripture here, it says blessed are the peacemakers. It's saying, look, to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be satisfied in life, you have to open the door to the blessing with this key. It only happens God's way. The first couple of ones that we've dealt with are all internal. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's what's going on on the inside. And we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm, I'm broken over my sin. There's nothing that I can do about it. And then we say, blessed are those who mourn. And so we begin to have a, a deep, uh, just hurt in our heart when we break God's heart. And then blessed are the meek. And then, you know, over and over again, blessed are the merciful. Well, we've gone over all those already, but we want to look at this idea that says, blessed are the peacemakers, where they shall become the sons of God. Some people define peace this way. Peace is the absence of conflict. Wouldn't it be nice if that happened in your life? That there is an absence of conflict. Uh, how many of you ever had a time in your life when you've had an absence of conflict? There's been nothing wrong whatsoever. Nothing wrong in your family, nothing wrong at your job, nothing wrong in the things that are going on in your life, nothing wrong in your church, nothing wrong in your soul or in your spirit. Just everything you just have, and that song says, I just got that peaceful, easy feeling. The reality is, most of y'all have never ever gone in a period of your life that you've had a time of the absence of conflict. That is not what that word peace means, an absence of conflict. A, a, a lady came to her pastor one day. You know, it's good to come to your pastor every once in a while. So this lady came to her pastor and, and she said, you know what, preacher, I'm, I'm so tired of all the stuff that I have to deal with. Things at my home and things at my job and, and things in my own mind and I'm dealing with stuff in my own life. I'm just so tired of dealing with all of the trouble and tribulation that I have to go through in life. Pastor, what should I do about it? So he said, you know what? Well, why don't you hop into the car with me and I'll take our secretary along and, and I want to take us on a little field trip. And so they go through the town and stuff. And they go towards the outside of the outer skirts of the town. And all of a sudden they end up, and the lady's looking around like, what are we doing here? And he looks around. You see one headstone after the other after the other. And then it has this little part, this little gate that you walk through. And then he takes her to, to a cemetery. And all of a sudden she begins to wonder herself, you know what, well, why would the pastor, when I go through trouble and tribulation and heartache and all this stuff, why would he take me out to this place in the cemetery? And he lets her get out of the vehicle and says, you know what, when you are in there, that is the only time that you will ever be at peace here in this world. You know what I mean? The reality is we will always face tribulation. For all of your life, you will face times of conflict. Conflict in here, conflict in there, conflict with those around you. You will always go through times of conflict. So what does the Bible say about this word called peace? Well, peace in the Bible is used about 400 times. All throughout the Bible, 400 times. A lot of times it translates this Hebrew word called shalom. You may wonder, well, what does that mean exactly, shalom? Well, shalom is when you would greet somebody and you would say hello, and then also before you would say goodbye, you would say shalom as well. In Hawaii, if you ever go there, it's the same way with aloha. You say when you greet them, and you say when you leave that place. You know, aloha, aloha to you as well, and then you, and you leave. So that's what this word shalom here means. It means to be uh, a whole, a blessing, a satisfaction. And so when the Bible talks about peace, it says, you know what? You greet peace and you say, you know what? I want God's wholeness and God's satisfaction, God's fulfillment. And then when you say goodbye, you say goodbye to all of those things that disturb and trouble and hinder you in that seeking of peace. And so that is what shalom is. And it is the very peace of God. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you look at the news, you look at your families, you look at your spirit and your own life, you'll realize that there ain't a whole lot of peace going on anymore. I mean, the reality is, you know what, when it comes to peace between black and white and Hispanics and even, you know, Hawaiians or Indians, whoever it might be, there's not a lot of peace in those relationships together. There's not a lot of peace when it comes to marriages that suffer and fall apart. And this person doesn't like this person, and, and they're in the same house, but there's no peace in that home. And peace between you and your children. And all of a sudden, you know what, you're, you're trying to live at peace with them, but they're always at odds. And, and you just can't seem to bridge the gap between you and their lives. There's always 
dysfunction and distraction and hindrances to, to peace. And you look around the world and we think about terrorism and violence and all the stuff that's going around. And we wonder to ourselves, where is this peace that, that was said by the angels to Jesus? I, I bring to you good news of great joy that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And they say, peace on earth and goodwill to men. Well, where is this peace? On earth, in our homes, in our churches, in our own lives. Why don't we experience peace? And Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, when I think about people today, there are, there are three kind of folks that I've thought about when it comes to peace. There are some that are peace fakers, and then some that are peace takers, and then hopefully there are some that are peacemakers as well. Let me describe to you what a peace faker is. A peace faker, and you may be one of those folks today, is somebody who just doesn't like to deal with conflict. Now, you'd rather sweep it under the rug. You'd rather ignore it. You just don't want to deal with it because it's a little bit too much. It'll cause too much drama in your family and your relationships if you really deal with the issue at hand. And so you're going you're gonna to fake it. You're going to put your head in the sand. You're going to find ways to avoid it or, or ways to accommodate or appease folks. You're just going to find ways not to have to deal with the fact that you are at war with folks. When I was growing up, my grandmother lived in in Austria, um, in Europe over there, right next to Germany. And there was Germany, and then there was Austria, and then right above there was this place called Hungary. And so what often happened was is that we would go to my grandmother's house in, in Austria, and when we would go there, uh, she lived like on a dairy farm, and they had these little row farms and everything. So we'd go over there, but in the back fields behind our house there in Austria, uh, all of a sudden we began to look, and, and you would see this huge fence. And then along this huge fence, you'd see about every, every kilometer or so, you'd see these towers. And on these towers, they had these uh, Hungarian guards that were there. This was during the, the Cold War between folks. And, you know, you had the Soviet bloc and you had everything kind of guarded off. And so while we would go there, we could walk up close to the fence. And there was even the guard up there who had his Uzi just kind of pointed down so that if you dared to go across that fence, they would kill you right away. There was an active conflict there, but, you know, we'd go up there, and it was like, you know, we were little American kids. He's like, man, look at that. That dude's a little thing. You know, wow, look at that. But it was amazing as a little kid. But the reality was, I didn't know it at that time, but there was this thing called a Cold War. But we were at war with that place. The, the free and the, those who were in communist countries, they would battle against each other. No shots were being fired at that time, but there was a continual, constant war with those folks. They didn't want to deal with it, though, but they had a war. And in some of your houses, if we were to be a fly on the wall in your house, you may be having a cold war in your house as well. Folks don't want to talk to each other. Folks don't like each other. Folks can't get along. Instead of dealing with the issue, you want to just kind of sweep it under the rug. Stay in your room. I'll stay in mine. You stay in your bed. I'll stay in my bed. You stay on your couch. I'll stay in my recliner. And we'll just kind of keep at odds with each other. Not, not dealing with the issue at hand, but just kind of having a, a cold war. How does that happen sometimes? Well, sometimes y'all go to Walmart. And in Walmart, you see that person that you just can't not stand. I just want to just beat them. But but it's a cold war, and you don't want to deal with that right now, and you don't want to get into the issue, so what do you do? You see them go down the grocery aisle, or well, you go down the linens, or all of a sudden, you sneak around that corner, you don't want to deal with them, you don't want to see them, so instead of going there, you wait until they get to the water in the back, and then you make your way to the toothpaste aisle. And so you're watching the whole time, what is the problem there? The problem is that you're just a peace faker. There is no real peace. You're just trying to cover it under the rug. And so many of you and your families are doing the same thing. You're not dealing with what's going on. And so some of you are peace Fakers. You know what other folks are? They are peace takers. Anybody got some peace takers in your life? Anybody, you, you know some folks that are just, they just want, they, they, they don't want you to be happy. They don't want you to have a peace of mind. They want to make sure that whenever they're around you, or you know what, you'll see this little comment on Facebook. And I love these little comments on Facebook where all of a sudden, you know what, it's like, you know, you know what somebody's saying, but they ain't saying your name, but they just specifically saying it just to steal some of your peace. Just to kind of like, get a little, get a little jab in. Just a little, just a little, you know, I'm not saying about this person, but y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. But just a little, just a little, uh, just a little little jab in there. What are they doing? They're trying to, to take your peace. And there's a lot of things that want to take your peace. For example, one is the devil. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so if he can do anything to steal the, the peace of mind, to steal the peace that you have with the Lord, to just take away all those stuff, he wants to destroy peace. In the beginning, birds were chirping 
bass were swimming, dogs were whatever dogs barking. It was just like a peaceful time. And then Satan comes slithering in and destroys all the people. And since that point on into the book of Revelation where it reveals that there will be peace again, no more crying, sickness, sorrow, pain, no more of that chaos. So all of a sudden from the beginning to the end, and we're unfortunately stuck in the middle where Satan wants to just steal and kill all of your peace. Here's another peace taker. It's sin. Can I tell you that you cannot live in sin and live in the peace of God at the same time? Ooh, that got real quiet. Got real quiet. What's wrong with y'all? Got really, really quiet. Because you cannot live in sin. You can't live and say, you know what? Well, I, I, I want to do things however I want to do them. I want to live however I want to live. I want to do and live my life however I feel like living my life. And you cannot do that and still live at peace with God. Those things just will not work. You cannot live in peace with God and sin in your own life. And so the Bible says, you know what? You'll always be miserable. Maybe that's why some of you can never get satisfied. You can never get fulfilled. You'll never be happy and blessed because you're not living in peace because you're continuing to live in, in sin. Sin always destroys peace. But then not only the devil and sin, here's another peace taker. It's just certain people that you allow in your life. But when you allow certain people in your life to steal peace and to take peace and to destroy your peace, uh, guess whose fault that is at times? That's your own fault. Why are you letting folks into your life that you know they don't want to do anything else but steal your peace? Why are you letting them in your life or letting their attitudes in your life or letting their, their, their ways of being in their life? And all of a sudden you know that they don't want anything else just to, to tear you down. And so the reality is a lot of us know peace takers and troublemakers. And the reality is those are some of those folks in your life that just want to steal and rob your peace, peace and joy. And the, the, just the fulfillment that you need and desire. And yet they just grab it and they take it and they want it right out of your life. Well, can I tell you one of the worst peace takers of all? It's not the other folks that you have to deal with. One of the worst people that takes your peace away is this guy and that girl. It is, it is you. You oftentimes take away your own peace. You say, how do I do that? Because you continue to want to live a lifestyle that you know God doesn't want you to live, but you want to make your own choices. You want to do things your own way. And so you're stealing and robbing your very own, own peace. And Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace fakers and not the peace takers, but the peacemakers, not the peace wishers and hopers, but the peacemakers, not those folks that are lovers of, of everything else or keepers, and, but no, it's, it's peacemakers. And so what is a peacemaker? I mean, that's what I want to focus on just for a couple of minutes. If the Bible says blessed are the peacemakers and we want to live a blessed life, what does it mean to be a blessed are the peacemakers? Well, here, here's the first thing. Those who will make peace are those who make peace between them and, and God. That, that, that is the first thing that you ever need to make peace with is between you and God. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 14, says it this way, that, that Jesus Christ himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. See, Jesus Christ is our, he is our peace. The, he is the prince of peace. The greatest turmoil in your life, it is not other folks, it's not Satan. The greatest turmoil on the inside of your soul is that there is no peace between you and God. And the only way to find peace is through Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, you know, it, it, ain't through, it ain't through anybody else, through anything else. It is just through Jesus Christ. He is our peace. And your greatest battle isn't between people. Your greatest battle is a spiritual battle. It is a war that is fighting for the peace of your soul. And so the greatest need a person has is peace with God. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. The peace is the presence of God in your life. That is where you find peace. I guarantee you. You can have the most money in this world and be the most miserable person of all time. You can live the most beautiful place and be the loneliest person inside that house. You can have everything in your job that you would think that this would satisfy me and be the most unhappy, miserable person. Why? Because there's no peace on the inside. If there's no peace on the outside, you can throw as much outside stuff that you want, but if there's no peace inside, then that doesn't matter because everything outside can never bring you satisfaction and peace. Peace is not the absence of strife, but it's the presence of Jesus. Can I just brag on, on Jesus for just a moment? I mean, I mean I, when, when we're talking about Jesus, I'm talking about the Jesus who 
loved you enough to give his life on the cross. He is the one who is our peace. I'm talking about the Jesus who said, you know what, I live a perfect life just for you. He is our, our peace. I'm talking about the Jesus who can just simply take the eyes of the blind and heal them. The Jesus who can take those and raise them from the dead. I'm talking about that Jesus is our peace. The Jesus who loves you and who has a plan for your life. The Jesus who forgives you of every one of your sins. The Jesus who says, I am right by your side as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That is the Jesus that is our peace. He is the Jesus that is your peace. He's the one who loves you and cares about you enough to say, you know what, no matter the craziness that you go through, he is still your peace. He is, he is Jesus. Friends, you ought to, you ought to get to, to know him better. You ought to know that there's just, there's just something about the name of Jesus. I mean, there's just something about Jesus. There's the sweetest thing that I know. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about Jesus. Jesus, you ought to get to, to know where there's peace through the cross of Jesus. And you can't be a peacemaker until you know the God who is the God of peace. And, and today, if you're, if you're lost without Jesus, you need to give your life to him. There will never be peace in your life or in your marriage or in your home or in your family until you give your life to Jesus. Nothing will make sense. There will always be war and conflict and strife inside until you give your life to Jesus. Friends, I don't have a lot to offer you. I don't have a lot to give you. But I can just definitely tell you about Jesus. And when he comes in, then the Prince of Peace takes over and gives you peace with God. But you see, the problem is we're... We're not at peace with him, and so we can't ever be a peacemaker. And so I want you to be at, at peace with God. But here's the thing, is that God has called us to, to be peace, peacemakers, which means that we're called to, to share peace with, with others. We're, we're called to share peace of God with others. To, to not only make it so that they come to know Jesus Christ. And, and friends, if you go to heaven and you don't take anybody with you because you never shared Jesus with anybody, then, then you wasted 40, 50, 60, 80, 90 years of your life. If you get to the end of your life and you never shared Jesus with one person, I mean, there's going to be no one in heaven because of you. What, what kind of a life have you wasted that God has given you that you don't want to share Jesus? And so we ought to make be peacemakers to be be at peace ourselves, but then to share the Prince of Peace with others. But you know, I'll wrap it up with this, because not only are you called to, to share peace and to be a peacemaker, but you're actually called to make peace with other people. Not just between them and God, but between you and, and other people. Let me ask you just a quick question. And this will be one of those raising the hands things. How many of you would say today, you know what? I, I'm, I'm lacking peace in my mind, in my family, at my job, with past relationships, with people that I've gone through, with some of the things that I've dealt with. I, I, I'm just in need of a little peace between these people. Anybody here this morning would say, you know what, there's some areas of my life that I just need peace with. All right, well, thank you for your honesty. The reality is, in the middle of that, the Bible calls you and I to be peacemakers. Romans 12, verse 17 says, We pay no one evil for evil. Isn't that nice to do? Sometimes, though, you got me, I'm going to get you back. No, we pay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And this is what it says in verse, verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And let me say with all women as well. With all peoples that you have to deal with on a regular basis. Bob says, look, if it is possible as far as you, you better try to live at peace with everyone. But a peacemaker is not just somebody who fakes it, not just somebody who takes it. A peacemaker is somebody who, who doesn't just try to avoid or appease. No, a peacemaker is somebody who, who does this. They, they, they take the first step to make peace with somebody. They take the initiative. They take the first step to be at, at peace with somebody. Can I, can I ask you a question? And you won't have to raise your hand. But who is it that person in your life that you are having a little bit of like, you know what, just a little bit of cold war, real war, just over and over again, speaking battles. I mean, you just the two of you cannot. Who, who is it in your life that you're not at peace with? Can I tell you what the Bible says? The Bible says that you are the one that's called to take the first step. That's what a peacemaker does. That's what a peacemaker does. He, he takes the, the first step. Can I tell you, when you're taking the first step, the first step you 
better take is you better take a first step to Jesus. Because you can't deal with crazy folks if Jesus ain't in the middle of in your life, in the middle of everything that you're going through. Am I right? I mean, you know, you better take the Jesus, I need you. Oh, Jesus, I'm about to smack you. Oh, Jesus, I just, just you know, no, you, you better, you better take that first step between you and Jesus. That's why the Beatitudes start with blessed are the poor in spirit. Because I guarantee you, there are some folks in your life that you just want to beat down, but you better come to the Lord and say, no, Lord, I, I know my own sin. I want to be poor in spirit. And you ought to mourn over those relationships that are broken in your life, that aren't fixed, that have so much lack of peace. And you ought to say, Lord, I just, I just need you. I mourn over my sin. I, I throw away my pride. I'm going to be meek. I, I, I want to be merciful as you're merciful, Lord. Help me to stay pure in heart. And, and we got to start with Jesus. Only Jesus can make it possible to love the impossible folks that you have to deal with every single day. Only Jesus. That's why it says, if it is possible, the reality is sometimes it just ain't possible. There are some folks that are going to be crazy. They've been crazy all their life. They're going to continue to be crazy. They've been people that are crazy around them. They just act that way. They're going to stay that way. So some folks you can't deal with. But, you know, the Bible never says deal with them. You know what the Bible says to deal with? It says deal with your own self. Deal with you. Deal with your attitude towards him. Deal with your ways of dealing with folks. Deal with the fact that he's saying, you know, you be the, the peacemaker. And what do we do? We often want to wait. No, when, when they act right, then I'll do right. When they start acting, you know, crazy and stuff, then, then maybe I'll let them in. No one, when they apologize, when they get their stuff together, that's when I'll wait. And, you know, we'll make things right then. No, the Bible says you be the peacemaker. You take the first step. You be the one that initiates that contact with him. Let me put it in this way. Did Jesus wait on you or did you wait on Jesus? Did, did Jesus wait on you to get your act right together? Or did he come in the middle of your life when your life was just out of, out of whack and out of control? See, he didn't wait until you got your life in church and you started acting right, and talking right, and listening right, and doing right. No, he, he came right to where you are. He took the first step to, to where you are, and that's what he says for you to do as well. You need to be a peacemaker who takes that, that first step. Being a peacemaker means that you do just like, like Jesus did. That's why it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? You remember what it says? Called what? The, the sons, the, the daughters, the, the children of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, and parents, you can probably relate to this, and grandparents can relate to this. Uh, you ever been to a ball game, like, for example, the other day? We went to Frank Town at Bug Loose's ball game. Uh, it didn't quite turn out the way that some wanted to, but it did turn out the way that others wanted to. And so all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in the stands, and, and I hear this fellow by the name, they call him Pop. And so all of a sudden, Pop is, is yelling for number 19. Come on, number 19! Come on, boy, you got it! And so all of a sudden, he's standing up, and like, that's my number 19, 19! I, I don't know if you've ever seen parents and grandparents start yelling for their babies. But Diamond, we come to you some of your games, so we're going to be there yelling for now. Oh, that we're going to be yelling, but, but all of a sudden, Pop is up there, he's yelling, that's my boy, that's my boy. And folks who didn't know whose boy it was, they looked and said, okay, number 19, that, all right. The Lord says, you know what, when you begin to look at folks that, that you're not at peace with, when you begin to look at folks that you have odds with, when you begin to look at folks that you know what, they've hurt you in ways, and it's just, just painful to even think about being merciful to them or being a peacemaker with them, all of a sudden, when you take that first step, you know what God is saying, I can imagine God the Father up in heaven and saying, you know what? That's my boy. That's my girl. Look, look, look at that crazy one they had to deal with, but still they, they took the first step. Look at all those issues they have in their family, but, but she took the first step. Look at all those things that could have been wrong, but she was willing to, to follow me. She's going to be more like Jesus. She's willing to be called the son and, and the daughter of God himself. And I can just imagine God in heaven looking down and saying, that, that one's mine. That was mine. It's worth the sacrifice. That was mine. She knew they loved me through this. That was mine. Look, look at my boy. They're called the sons and the daughters of the Lord. And can I tell you real quick? I didn't like this passage of scripture. <laughs> because I knew that it was coming up. And I said, Jesus, that one, I'm going to have to try to skip that. I'm going to do it like on a Wednesday. And then we can get this thing over with. Because I don't want to talk about making peace with folks who do and I am not at peace with at this moment. And all of a sudden, I just, it's like clear as day. The Lord said, all right, all right, boy, what, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about this passage of Scripture? And I'm like, Lord, I don't even know where to start. I, you know, I don't even know which one to go to, which one to talk to. And, and you know, Lord, that's just kind of like, I'm going to pass it by. I, I'm a peace faker most of the time. And so, you know what? I don't want to deal with this right now. I'm slipping under the rug. I got other stuff to do. I don't want to deal with that. No time in my life. 
have to deal with that person. I hadn't talked to them in years, so why should I go and say anything to them? I'm good. I got myself. Me, myself. You know, I don't need to deal with that person. The Lord's like, no, uh, no, that, that ain't how this this thing works. That's not how it works, preacher boy. That's just not how it works. And so all of a sudden, I, I had to say, okay, Lord, where do you want me to start? I guess I got to start one one person at a time. And so I got back under my messages on my phone, and, and I went back to June the 24th, 2014, at 9.18 p.m. That's the last time that I talked to this guy, and I hadn't talked to him since then. I hadn't wanted to talk to him, didn't need him. It's like, you know what, if, if, if I feel like you wrong me, don't let the door hit you, or, you know you know what I'm saying? It's just like, all right, you, you go do you, I'm going to do me, I ain't going to worry about you anymore. And the Lord's like, no, at this time... You haven't talked to them since June 24, 2014. The last text that I sent them, the last text that he sent me, you know what? There wasn't a whole lot of love expressed. There wasn't a whole lot of feelings to the, uh, you know, mutuality concerning each other. Now, it's like, you know what? We done. I'm good. You do you. I'm going to do me. Time to go. So all of a sudden, I, I had to get my phone out. I had to use that phone and dumb messages. I wasn't sure if he read them, so then I had to get them on Facebook and text the same dumb things. <laughs> Wasn't doing it willingly, but I was like, all right, Lord, let me try to get this one right. Let me, let me just be a, a peacemaker. I can't be telling folks out here to try to do something they don't want to do for somebody that they don't really want to have in their life anymore, but they got to get this thing right just because it messes up the peace of God between them and they need to feel what it's like to have their father in heaven say, that's my boy, that's my girl. So if I can't do it, then I'm not going to expect you to do it either. But, but I, I sent a text, sent a message, message of blessing. They say, look, man, you know, I, I appreciate who you are as a man, and as a husband, as a father, as just somebody who's been in my life. You know, we had not talked, and I just want to make this thing right. So it took a little, a little bit of pouring spirit. It took a little humbling morning a little bit of meekness to say, I, I can't do this on my own, Lord. You, you better do this for me. And then take a little bit of the Lord just saying, okay, this is in your heart. So some of you are thinking about those people that are in your life. Where do you start? You start, first of all, by getting right with Jesus. You, get, you start with Jesus. You can't start with your own willpower. It ain't going to work. You got to start with Jesus. And everything in your life, you got you to start with Jesus. To get your marriage right, you got to start with Jesus. To get your family right, you got to start with Jesus. To get things in your mind right, you got to just start with Jesus. And so I had to start with Jesus and then just take it one person and one step at a time. Can I tell you something? If you do what Jesus wants you to do, it will always be worth it. You say, how and why would it be worth it? Because it would be worth it to hear God the Father say, that's my boy. That's my girl. They belong to me. And that's why they do all that they've done. You want to hear him say that? Takes that key. Key of being a peacemaker. Not a peace faker. Not a peace taker. But a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. Would you bow with me for a moment? If you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, we'd love to hear about your decision to follow Him. We hope that you might be able to contact us on Facebook or call us at our church line. It's just an opportunity for us to help you grow in your newfound relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we love you and we're glad that the Lord is moving in your life. We pray that He continue to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul as you hunger and thirst for righteousness.